When it comes to creativity and ingenuity, one doesn't have to go too far here in Central Ohio to find a craftsman or woman who is making something truly unique. And many times the skills are passed down from generation to generation. That's the case in our first story, where a son is carrying on his father's hand press printing business. We head to Chillicothe for that story. We're just coming into downtown Chillicothe, the seat of Ross County, a really historic community settled in the late 18th century, 1796, by a settler named Nathaniel Massey. And Nancy, it has some of the best architecture in the state, wouldn't you agree? Absolutely. Not just the downtown area, but the residential areas. A lot of early 19th century architecture that you don't see in a lot of historic communities throughout the state. We're going up the hill, the big hill that's on the west side of uh, downtown Chillicothe. We're going up to visit a place called Mountain House, and we're going to be meeting Dart Hunter. This is the old family home. I've been looking forward to making this visit. we go. It is quite a house. <laughs> Hi Dart. Hi Nancy, welcome. Thank you so much for having us. Oh my pleasure. We are so Hi, Jeff. excited to get this tour well, today. Shall we take a look? Absolutely, come on in. Uh, I've been here once or twice but uh, there's always another story to tell isn't there? Right, absolutely. Oh my gosh, this is wonderful. Oh yeah, it's a great old house. Oh look at this. Yeah, this was really the last room that my grandfather created when he uh, did his renovations in 1920 mm -hmm. after purchasing the house in 1919. These stained glass windows look like paper making? They are. They really uh, kind of study the history of printing and paper making. And these were made by your grandfather? My grandfather made these between 1925 and 1930. For this space? For this space. For his library. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then he was a figure in the arts and crafts movement. He the Roy was. Crofters, it's, it's all sort of the same thing, I think, isn't that correct? That's correct. He uh, did Many graphic designs made all the leaded glass windows for the Roycroft Inn. Uh, he made pottery and jewelry. And, but there was one component missing from uh, that which the Roycrofters were doing, and that was handmade paper. So they were publishing books much the way it would have been done you know, in medieval times, and they had a medieval look because they were importing papers from Europe. Mm -hmm. He thought that was kind of a tragedy. So he spent the rest of his life, really from 1911 on, doing nothing but studying the history of paper making, hmm. as well as uh, collecting artifacts from around the world on how other cultures had made paper. Do you have any other elements of the past you'd like to share with us? We do, we have several in the studio. Would you like to come Fantastic, in? Fantastic, of course. That's where all the work gets done. Yes. Oh, look at this so space. So this is the studio that my grandfather created. Oh my gosh. Uh, he chose these two Washington hand presses to use to produce all of his books. Really the same principle that Gutenberg would have had, a very simple platen that comes down to make the impression. That's remarkable. And then you, when you're printing, it's one page at a time. That's correct. I've pulled the last book that my grandfather produced here, oh. uh, Paper Making by Hand in America, which all eight books that he produced here were on different aspects wow. of paper oh. making. So this was really his magnum opus. What a beautiful book. A lifetime gorgeous. achievement uh, in the study wow. of paper making in America. And this is the mold that my grandfather used to make the paper uh, for the book. So this is a, an early European mold uh, with a removable decal uh, with a laid uh, wire covering with this watermark. So anywhere we have this, uh, we take wire, stitch it to the mold surface, mm -hmm. and that will create slightly less pulp in these areas, creating a shadow. So the pulp is the ground up rags and That's water, correct. and uh, it's kind of a slurry that you... It is a slurry. You, we you dip, dip into the, uh, dip the vat, okay. and we shake it in all directions, so there's no grain direction in handmade paper. Aha. Uh -huh. So... What a process. Tremendous. Are these watermarks back here? These are watermarks that were made in the same paper mill that he made uh, the paper for that book. He was really trying to encourage sales of handmade paper, which during the Depression was quite a hard commodity to sell. I'm sure So it he was. was offering custom watermarks. Paper making is still part of what you do here? You still it make is. paper? It is. We, we think it's, it's very important to continue Okay, and then that. you do the printing, and you must have other, other lines of business as well that, we, that build on that tradition? We do. We actually started uh, uh, a business called Dart Hunter Studios. We work with a lot of artists around the country uh, who are working in the same styles of, of design as the arts and crafts movement, and uh, we do that in our studio downtown. 
And we'll be seeing that a little bit later. You will, yes. Thank you. What a, what a building! What well, a thank space! You. Thank you. This is really interesting. Tell us tell us about the building first. Well, uh, this was built originally as a canal warehouse, ah. uh, serving the Ohio Erie Canal. The canal came to the rear of the building. Boats would actually dock right against the building, and they would unload and store their dry goods in the building. And then, from 1900 until 1950, the uh, electric company had purchased it and. They installed all the cabinetry throughout the building, which worked out perfectly, perfectly for our for use. You. Yeah. yeah, so it really couldn't have been a better building for us. Dart, it's been just really great visiting. Thank you so much for, for having well, us today. Thank you. I it's really been a fascinating it. visit. Thank you, it's Nancy. just we love Chillicothe. This really added to the experience of a great historic city wow. to actually get the story of your family and this beautiful art. Drilling down to some of those local stories is just one of the one of the best things. Right. Well, I always enjoy telling them, so thank you. You've probably heard the old adage that food is a necessity of life, right? But in my opinion, that doesn't mean it has to be boring, especially when it comes to dessert. In our next story, I had the chance to visit Pistachia Vera, where each dessert is beautifully crafted for the eyes and the stomach. Here's their story. <laughs> Columbus, Pistacia Vera is definitely a dessert destination. From pastries to specialty cakes to their signature macarons, siblings Spencer Boudros and Ann Fletcher strive to bring classical technique and artistic endeavor together. Today I'm sitting down with them in their pastry kitchen and cafe in German Village to find out how they do it. So now I gotta ask, are, are you both bakers? Or who's the baker? Spencer who's... gets the credit for the talent okay. behind the food. Okay. I'm the baker in the, in the team. Even though we both grew up in the Columbus area, uh -huh. um, I spent 13 years um, away in Phoenix, okay. in North Scottsdale, and, okay. and went through a pastry apprenticeship, and then um, had children and wanted to move home. And uh, Raise our babies in Columbus. Oh, okay. Absolutely. So I really, really thought that there was a demand for this type of, of dessert and pastry. Luckily, my sister, um, agreed to be my business partner, and um, and the rest is history. All right. So you're the you're the heart of the baking business, and you're the the head, the mind. <laughs> the sure, brains. I get All that right. credit All for right. it. We'll take that. I'm the people right. I'm the people side, I guess, in the sense of taking care of. We have a staff of 43 now. There's a good energy here. Like I feel like your staff enjoys what they're doing, and they put a lot of love into the work. But it starts with you all putting love into it first, and then it and it comes from your staff as well, right? So I think that we recognize, you know, the that people, the people come, come through these doors to treat themselves, and we like to treat it as such. So it's great coming to work every day and being yeah. able to work just with a great team. Awesome. Well, now, so how would you describe your, your baking style? I would say our style pays homage more than anything, just a classic French technique. Okay. A lot of our recipes <laughs> are, are uh, just have a few ingredients, but the method and the technique behind it are a couple pages long. So uh, we're really attracted to pastry that takes care. So. Okay, wow. Uh, well, clearly you're passionate about pastries. Now, what did you do, Ann, to, you, you know, bring the business side around uh, your brother's passion for creating these amazing pastries? Yeah, when we look back, when we opened up in the back alley of the Short North in 2004, it's kind of that front end of the food scene. Yeah. Kind of made it up as we go along in a little bit, you know, in the sense of trying to find ourselves. Um, in 2007, we made the strategic decision to move to German Village, just be, we loved the short north, but we were a day business. Yeah. And there was something from a quality of life for us, of a commitment to stay as a cafe, get the vibe of the morning scene, right. and kind of that sense of community for an afternoon coffee. Put those two pieces together of, yeah. of good historic kind of vibe to the neighborhood. This is a quirky, strange building, yeah. but we've embraced it. This building definitely has some yeah. interesting architecture, and so I'm sure it has an interesting history. Can you tell me about that? Um, it was originally a two-story home back in the 30s. Wow. George Reiner, um, he was the classic German bakery story. Came to America to build his bakery of windows, 
and it operated under his family name, Reiner's, and you'll see the signia on our Hoster side of the building okay. um, until the 70s. And then the Plank family purchased it from the Reiner family, and Plank is a big name in the community as well. They renamed it Therns, okay. so as kids growing up, we would eat donuts and like salad sandwiches at the at the counter at yeah. Therns. Um, and then they closed their family business um, right about the time that we were making the decision to move back. So it was super inspiring to kind of get the baking vibe back in these brick walls and completely rehab the place and really try to restore a lot of that original charm and character right, right, to what right. it was. Yeah, and you've clearly been able to maintain the spirit of what happens here in German Village. So let me ask you this, as an artist, because that's what I consider you to be an artist. Uh, um, where do you go for your inspiration? We certainly look outside of Columbus. We certainly look to Europe. We cer certainly look to the to the French masters. When it comes to the actual design of the pastry, I would say that we are we are intentionally very restrained in the way that we present our pastry. And then there's just a general seasonality too. You know, that's kind of that inspiration of okay, what feel what do you what feels good? You know, when the when there's warmth in the air. Now. Clearly, from your conversation, community is something that you all highly value. Now, how does that um, translate into the work that you do? German Village is as community as it gets. So we first started in our home base. And then the fun part is we've got something that people love to eat. So we support things that we personally are passionate about but also really look to our customers and let them take the lead for things. So it's a win-win. It's a way to give back of saying, thanks for supporting our business. Let us help support what you're passionate about. Well, uh, thank you so much for having it. It's clear you all care about pastries and about your community. And so I think that's why you're experiencing the success that you're experiencing, because people are drawn to care. And so I appreciate you all for that. And uh, I appreciate you for sharing this, because I really care about <laughs> <laughs> digging into these pastries a little bit more. So thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> If you live in Clintonville or drive anywhere near it, you've probably seen various works of yarn art pop up in some unconventional places. And no one knows for sure who's behind it. The only thing we know about this Clintonville yarn bomber? Well, they work under the cover of darkness, they get the help of fifth grade students in Linden, and they surprise a lot of people when their creations suddenly appear. Here's that story. My grandmother Haas. She was very skilled at embroidery and crocheting and knitting, dabbled in sewing. She took me under her wing. My grandmother actually grew up here in North Columbus. She was a polar bear alum, fiercely loyal. I still have some of the mementos, including her class of 1926. This is my grandmother there. Her pictures when she was a 1920s flapper um, dancing her way through uh, North Columbus. This is my grandmother as I remember her. This is me and it would be a few years after this that we had our first crochet needle in our hand. She met a dashing student at Ohio State. He took my grandmother back to Orville to live on the farm where uh, I was born and raised and then I would via OSU, find myself right back in her old stomping grounds. I picked up the needles again about four years ago, and I was a little rusty. And I remembered this really cool, funky activity called yarn bombing. And then I thought, this is what I'm gonna do. Those very first bands I put up on High Street were so simple. Really, it was me kind of getting back into learning my stitches again and getting the feel of it. But I would make a band at night, um, make a cup of coffee, walk up to High Street, stitch it on early in the morning, smile at it every time I drove by. It was exclusively just for me and my mental health. The folks who caught me were those darn healthy people, the runners. And I never worried about being spotted so much in the early because I was thinking of it just for me. As it progressed, particularly when I started seeing it get noticed on social media, 
I thought, um, okay, well, I uh, need to keep this on the down low a little bit more. I, I want to stay undercover on this. When we made the move to more of a commissioned piece, everything changed. Doing it in one spot on High Street under a street light, uh, under the cover of darkness, worked fine. When I found myself creeping around people's dark backyards at night, that's when we invested in a miner's light. The ideas for the pieces, either there's a message that I want to play upon. There was a situation that was very humorous in Clintonville that dealt with a kangaroo sign. So I made a kangaroo. Or I will see a structure and I see it as something different. I see the bike rack as a caterpillar crawling. I don't uh, get too involved in um, activism, but there have been some that have spoke to climate change or Pride Month. The Tin Soldier maybe is my favorite until this Christmas when I anticipate a new favorite. What we're gonna do at first is learn the basic stitches. And honestly, once you know these stitches, the world is open to you. I saw in Italy a Christmas tree that had been made of individual granny squares. Granny square is a project in crochet that's almost the, the first thing everyone learns how to do. And, and I thought I would love if we could gather granny squares from all of the crocheters in, in Clintonville and create this beautiful piece of public art. You did great. You did great. On social media, I had noticed people commenting about the yarn bombs. Oh, it makes me want to learn to crochet. This is the opportunity. So I put out on social media that we would hold a free workshop. We actually had to go with two classes then because they filled up quickly and it was a diverse crowd and we had folks who had never had a crochet hook in their hand up through folks that did know how to crochet but wanted to learn the granny square and many went home and continued to make additional squares. We ended up with some people contributing up to 20 or 30 squares. We wanted to certainly have young people uh, involved. I knew from my own experience learning to crochet as a child uh, how much fun it would be. Fortunately, WOSU Classroom had the resources to make those connections. And now grab it and bring it through. The way the whole STEAM movement has come up, being S-T-E-M, um, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, we're leaving out that A for art. So it shouldn't be STEM, it should be STEAM. Art isn't just some frivolous thing we do to give kids downtime. It is a good way to sit and reflect and take some of those lessons they're learning in the classroom and apply them to something that seems unrelated, but actually does tie together. It was very hard to crochet because I really didn't know how to do most of the stuff. And Miss K and Miss Hanukkah really started to teach me. And then it started to get easy, and then I started to do it faster. I finished three. At first, it was tricky for me then, um, after I did it for a couple of days, um, I, got, I got the hang of it. At first, it was just like this little knot right here, but now it's like almost a granny square. I started right here at the knot. There should be a knot right there. And the hardest part was getting it through the holes because it always got tangled when I went through. I was most impressed with how quickly they got over their frustrations. Oh, you messed up? We'll just pull it out and we'll do it again. That was just practice. There it is, woohoo! I'm going to keep crocheting. I could teach my younger siblings when they like get older like me. I want to keep on like making blankets for the homeless. I hope they take away the confidence of knowing that no matter how hard something looks, that if they just keep trying, they can do it. It's so important for children today to feel a sense of belonging and a feeling a sense of purpose. And through maker spaces and through creating and making projects where they can show a little bit of themselves, I think is just a really inspiring moment. 
I think it's going to be a lot of granny scares on the young Bama Christmas tree. But I can't wait and to see how she's going to make it go come all together. Hello, Yarn Bombers! Hello, Yarn Bombers! Who is the Yarn Bomber? Who is the Yarn Bomber? We've been making granny squares for you. We've been making granny squares for you. Where is the Christmas tree going to be? I would like to think that my grandmother would just be thrilled for something that started out just for my own pleasure, to know, to hear, to read, how much it makes other people smile. It now has become the motivation. In the 19th century, it was thought that needlework was an indispensable skill for women, and it was a big part of their education. Ohio History Connection has preserved a few of their historic quilts, so we visited their collection to see the intricate craftsmanship for ourselves. <laughs> Hi, Hannah. Hey, Brent. How are you? Good, how are you? Good, uh, no pressure, but I understand you're gonna keep us in stitches today. Yes, very much so today. What do we have here? So we have some embroidery samplers from our permanent collection. What are we sampling? So we are sampling uh, embroidery stitches. These would have been done by young girls in the 1700s, 1800s. So this is their way to practice those skills that they'll use into adulthood. How old are these girls when they do this? So they could be anywhere from six to 16, at least for the samplers that we have in our collection. 1834, what do we know about the Mary Ann Edmondson? Yes, so we know that Mary Ann Edmondson was 10 when she made this, because we know she was born in 1824 and this is from 1834. And we know that this was done in Dayton, Ohio at the Waynesville School. Is this something they're learning from their mom or is there a formal education where they're learning this? So it honestly depends. So some girls may be learning from an older relative, but lots of girls are going to be taking formal classes or going to a school where this is part of the curriculum. What were these schools like? What do we know about the school from this kind of work? So we know in the case of Mary Ann that the school where she took this class, she was being trained in both plain and ornamental sewing. So we know that they had a fairly rigorous curriculum in terms of sewing at mm -hmm. least. Mm -hmm. And did I understand that when a suitor came calling, this would actually show off their skills? Yes, yeah, you can think of this like a resume almost. So obviously there are lots of things that go into a successful marriage proposal, but these girls would use these samplers as a way to show off their skills. If it includes a Bible verse, it helps to show off their virtue. So it's all kinds of things that the suitor might want to know about them. Well, this is beautiful. Now you have another piece or two you wanna show us? Absolutely, yes. I'll be pulling a couple more from another case down here. So we have a couple in here that we can talk about. Yeah, let's see what you have. All right, so we can start with the one over here. That on the looks like it's the side. oldest, maybe. It's one of our older ones, yeah. So this one is from probably around 1800, 1825 at the latest. Mm -hmm. And this one was actually not made in Ohio. This one, we believe, was actually made in Wales. And uh, how much has this faded over the years? Do we know, would this been much more vibrant and colorful 200 years ago? So it likely would have been, yes. So textiles are one of the most vulnerable to light damage of uh, historic objects. And so in the case of these, probably the fabric in the back has become discolored and some of the colors of the threads may have faded. Though of course there's a lot of variation depending on the kind of thread and the color. What's the next one you want to point out? So the next one is this one here in the center. This was done by a girl named Mary S. Waters when she was eight years old in 1822. Did she live in Ohio? 
She did live in Ohio as a married woman. So this was actually made when she was in Pittsburgh. She attended a seminary school there that was for just women and she learned how to sew there and made this as a student there again in 1822. What's the term? Is this embroidery? Is this cross stitch? Is it crocheting? What is this? So this is going to be embroidery and sometimes they're using a cross stitch. But they're going to be using a variety of stitches. So it's not crocheting, but it is embroidery and it sometimes cross stitch. And of course people still do this. Yes, absolutely. We get a lot of people in who really want to see these because they still do samplers and they still use these techniques. Were they starting from a pattern like people do today? Most likely, yes. So we have evidence on some of the samplers of pencil marks where they would have been drawing out the pattern beforehand. And if they're receiving formal education and how to do it, they likely are following some sort of pattern. Well, these are beautiful and impressive. Thank you for sharing them with us. Absolutely. Thanks for being with us, and remember you can catch all our episodes on columbusneighborhoods.org, plus see our stories on the WSU mobile app, and you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'll see you back here next week on Columbus Neighborhoods. I don't want no more of your red apple juice. I don't want me no honey baby now. I don't want me no honey baby now. I don't know.